Welcome to Coronavirus The Rundown. I'm Usher Qureshi. Each day we showcase the ways communities are taking on coronavirus. We also break down the major headlines. Today, concerns about new cases. We stand for the ones who's been knocked down. The ones who can't stand up no more because they don't have a voice anymore. Large groups gathered around the country this weekend to call for justice and change following the death of George Floyd. Now, some public health leaders worry the protest could fuel a new wave of coronavirus cases. Protesters were shoulder to shoulder, some not wearing masks. Leaders fear that will spark new outbreaks. There's also concern any new wave could impact black communities especially hard. Coronavirus might be deadlier in people who are battling cancer or who have in the past. A new study in The Lancet found 13% of cancer patients hospitalized with the virus died. A separate study in the Lancet found the death toll to be 28%. The study also says the pandemic forced 22% of cancer patients to pause treatments. Eli Lilly and company started testing its antibody therapy on people this week. This is phase one. It'll see if the treatment is safe and if it works. We should have those results late this month. If everything goes well, the treatment could be available this fall. As people return to work, things will be different for both employees and companies. Alicia Nieves shows us the role technology is already playing in the process. After nearly two months closed, this clothing store in Denver is reopening. I liken this to being a startup. This company started up in 1946, and uh, in some ways, being closed for nearly two months is, is like being a startup again. Steve Weil is Rock Mount Ranchware's president. We're doing everything that we know of to do, including masks for staff and customers, hand sanitizer when you walk in. We are segregating shirts that have been tried on to be steamed. From retail to the service industry, every business reopening has had to modify their operation to include new safety protocols and social distancing. On the one hand, we want to avoid more people getting infected. On the other hand, we need to get the economy going again. And it's, it's, it feels like a terrible choice. Howard Tierski is the CEO of a company called From the Digital Transformation Agency. From is developing an app called social safety. The main purpose of it is to act as a proximity detector. In a workplace, each employee would have a phone with the app installed. And when the app detects that another person running the same app is closer than approximately six feet away, it will start to give you an alert. Social safety can also help with contact tracing within the workplace by collecting data on employees that have worked near each other. Technology has made it a lot easier for viruses to spread. We need to be asking ourselves, well, how can we use technology to help combat the virus as well? I know that Apple and Google are working on embedding uh, contact tracing capabilities into both the iOS and Android operating systems, which I think is fantastic. I know that companies like Ford are working on wearable devices that can do uh, similar types of things to what we're working on. Whether it's new technology or new behaviors, most businesses reopening will tell others. Do it carefully and, and well thought out because if not, we risk the uh, a repeat of what happened the middle of March, and we can't afford that. Our entire economy depends on a successful relaunch. I'm Alicia Nieves reporting. Some places are looking empty right now, including doctor's offices and emergency rooms. A poll from Morning Consult and the American College of Emergency Physicians shows that 29% of adults in the U.S. have avoided or delayed medical care due to concerns surrounding coronavirus. Medical experts stress that routine visits are still necessary for both children and adults. Even ER visits can be necessary. There are people who are having stroke-like symptoms. And they don't come to the emergency department. If they had, potentially they could have different types of treatment, but they've delayed doing that and their results and their outcomes are worse than they could have been. Doctors say people absolutely need to come into the ER if they're experiencing shortness of breath, chest pain, stroke-like symptoms, or if you've recently experienced a bad injury. Hospitals and doctor's offices are taking their own precautions. All healthcare providers must wear a mask, as should patients. If patients don't have a mask, they are given one. Rooms are also cleaned extensively. You're coming often into rooms now that are uh, isolated in single rooms, which are 
not exposing you to other patients. So there's a whole range of things that we do to make sure we're keeping our departments as safe as they can be. In fact, doctor's offices are better able to enforce social distancing during this time because of the low volume of patients. Experts have found some people may be avoiding the doctor's office as a way to avoid putting strain on the health care system. But doctors say if people don't get the help they need now, the death rate may extend beyond just those infected with COVID-19. While these last few months, learning has happened mostly in front of a screen, so many of us parents have debated about how much screen time is too much. Lindsay Boach talked to experts who say thinking screen time is bad might be old school. Video games have changed a lot since the days of Atari Pong. Now, more than ever, they're designed to keep our kids engaged. There's science behind it. Once you really engage that reward system, it's frustrating and tough to pull kids off. Psychiatrist Joel Stoddard is an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Medicine. He says that's because a child's reward system is stronger than a child's control system. There's a difference in the way the brain reacts to video games compared to online schooling. Games are designed to really really engage their reward systems and keep their attention. Um, and, and so that's a little bit different than um, online school, which is not really designed in the same way to grab hold of those um, areas in the brain that are involved in like, oh, this this is what I want. Jennifer Walsh Rurak is with Fusion Academy, a private online high school. She says as the interaction from online school ends this year, it's going to be okay to allow your kids more screen time because the extra screen time is better than your kids having no interaction at all. In this day and age where they can't naturally go outside and engage with kids in the neighborhood. Um, we don't want to discourage them to have from having that, that social peer interaction, which we know is so critically important. Stoddard says the extra time on screens isn't all bad. It can actually be beneficial to an extent. All of our visual and screen areas are getting better. If you're gaming, um, maybe some of those spatial attention and those reward areas are going to get more sensitive. If we're doing social media, we're going to be highly attuned to be thinking about what does that like mean or not mean? The brain just gets better at what it does. But here's what parents need to watch for. We do know that um, video games can suck it as in so that they're not actually having normative, typical social interactions. Um, they might gain weight, for example, and have disrupted sleep. And those have sort of knock-on effects. If you start to see a, a child who's kind of glazed over, you know, staring at the screen, that's a, a good indicator that it's time for a break. It's all about finding the balance as we all learn to navigate this new reality. <laughs> I'm Lindsay Boach reporting. Hospitals expect they'll need more people to operate ventilators if there's another spike in cases. How they're using virtual training and robots to prepare the staff they already have. And the company that's dedicating its manufacturing facilities to making vaccines. Next. Game on. A drug being tested as a coronavirus treatment is showing some promising results. Remdesivir provided some benefits in people with moderate cases of coronavirus. That's according to Gilead Pharmaceuticals. It says 76% of people who took it for five days showed improvement compared to people who didn't take it. And that 70% of people who took it for 10 days showed improvement as well. It says it will submit the results of this study for publication in the coming weeks. Hospitals want to ensure they have enough ventilators if COVID-19 cases spike this fall. But as Amanda Brandeis learned, these complex machines also require more trained staff. So providers are now turning to lifelike robots and virtual training to prepare. When demand for ventilators goes up, having enough of them is only one part of the life-saving equation. There's only a finite group of people that are skilled and trained and authorized to use those ventilators. The machines help patients breathe, pumping oxygen into their bodies. But what's critically important is how you control that pressure. If you pump too much pressure into a patient, your lungs will explode. The stakes couldn't be higher, so hospitals are now working to train more staff members to operate the devices. Because we'd really rather have these nurses and docs 
practicing on a simulator before they're working on a live patient in a critical care situation. That's where Gamard Scientific comes into play. Hi. I'm pediatric Hal. Five-year-old Hal talks, breathes, and moves. He's a robot capable of simulating not just medical emergencies, but also emotions. He can actually be plugged into a real ventilator, and that ventilator will take control of his breathing functions. Companies like Gamard are seeing a spike in demand for training. Without being able to train in person, Zoom has become the norm. It's the closest thing to a real life scenario that you can get. Located just outside of Philadelphia, Lincoln Healthcare had already developed a program to teach their at-home nurses how to operate ventilators. We can change his breath rate and we can make him mimic what a true COVID patient is gonna look like. We really wanted to make sure that our nurses were armored with the best training, the best uh, emergency preparedness. They've now opened training to all medical professionals in Philly and surrounding cities. We actually saw uh, some nurses that weren't even planning to work in a hospital that signed up for the training. So right now he's turning the little blue and he's coughing. So Those hesitant to operate ventilators are finishing the training feeling empowered, knowing they're now part of the solution to this complex COVID-19 equation. In San Diego, I'm Amanda Brandeis reporting. Hispanic families are reporting coronavirus symptoms almost twice as much as non-Hispanic households. USA Today surveyed families across the U.S. One in 12 Latino households reported having COVID-19 symptoms between March and May. That number was lower for all other groups, one in 21 households. Unidos U.S., a Latino advocacy group, says the high number among Hispanic households is likely due to a variety of factors, including the fact that Latinos make up a large percentage of essential workers. There may also be a language barrier when it comes to understanding information. Hispanic households also tend to be larger with several generations living under one roof, which can make it difficult to social distance. Well, the government just signed a new contract worth nearly $630 million to help mass produce a potential coronavirus vaccine. Under the contract, Emergent Biosolutions will commit its manufacturing facilities to coronavirus vaccine production through 2021. The contract also awards the company funding to expand its overall drug manufacturing capacity. After being shut down for months due to COVID-19 concerns, more hotels are now reopening. As Kai Beach reports, they're redefining their cleaning and safety standards. The month of March was the worst month of, of my career by far. When guests check into Magnolia Hotel, they're greeted by new safety measures. It brings me more comfort staff cleaning more often. Sanitizing keys that guests have used. From social distancing markers on the floor to hand sanitizer at the door, this is the new norm for hotels operating during a pandemic. It's been very difficult in hospitality with COVID-19. Sarah Treadway is the president and co-CEO of Magnolia Hotels, a hospitality company with hotels across the country, which had to lay off 95% of its employees during the COVID-19 crisis. Many of our employees have worked for us for 30 plus years, so it's just been, it's been devastating. Devastating emotionally and financially, as coronavirus concerns have closed down thousands of hotels around the world. A lot of people there are feeling a lot of pain. Chip Rogers is the president and CEO of the American Hotel and Lodging Association. He says about two-thirds of all hotels have laid off at least half of their workers. And many hotels that closed due to COVID-19 might never reopen. In fact, the experts say that the industry will not fully recover until 2023. Actually, welcome you back to our hotel. To hopefully expedite that timeline, we are committed to providing you with a safe... Industry time. leaders are now focusing on new safety standards for working to defeat COVID-19. Marriott International is rolling out a new commitment to clean program. We're going above and beyond on our normal protocol. In Las Vegas, a city with 150,000 hotel rooms, MGM Resorts has started working with medical experts to develop a plan that will allow them to safely welcome guests back. Back at Magnolia Hotels, their increased attention to details is paying off. I'm very proud to say that none of our staff members have come down with COVID-19 because of our cleanliness standards from the beginning. This extra cleaning comes at a cost. 
it's a price that guests say is well worth it. They're even stepping beyond what uh, the protocol would and wait for them to do right now, so I think they're doing great. I'm Kai Beach reporting. Talking to kids about coronavirus and how it's changing the world can be tough. We'll show you the book that's helping make it a little easier next. Welcome back. Parents are struggling to manage the pressure of the pandemic. Explaining the virus to your kids isn't easy, but Chris Conti shows us how a book you can get for free is helping. It's a very unique time that we're living in. These days, it seems like waves are hitting us from every direction, with uncertainty always off the horizon. King COVID and the Kids Who Cared by Nicole Rim. But Nicole Rim is trying to provide calm in the pages that she turns. If we get sick by King COVID, we might feel tired with a cough, a sore throat, or a fever. This 40-year-old graphic designer has never written a book before. But the COVID-19 pandemic provided the inspiration she apparently needed to author her first children's book. I just wanted to produce something as fast as possible. I really felt the urgency to do this. The title, King COVID and the Kids Who Cared. The main character is a COVID-19 cell made out to be an evil crown-wearing king. He's fought off by kids who find magical superpowers. We can fight back. Did you know that soap is a super weapon? The message has hit a chord with parents struggling to explain coronavirus to their kids. See all those little crowns? Let's pretend his name is King COVID. So far, the book has been downloaded 50,000 times. It's been printed in four languages. The secret superpower is caring. But we can fight back. There's something about fighting off an evil king that kids understand and want to emulate. Kids are telling their parents nearly every day, I'm going to you know, wash my hands and wash away King COVID and his army. And the message seems to resonate even with the youngest readers. We can fight back. Really empowering kids to and encouraging kids to learn how to care for themselves and for others as we wait out this pandemic. As for the book itself, it's a free download. Nicole's only hope is it helps parents manage some of the pressure they're feeling right now. I really hope that somehow this book can help ease that um, difficulty in explaining some of these harder concepts to the children. As we write the next chapter in the story of this pandemic. When they look back at this experience, I hope that they can say, you know, I, I made a difference during that time. I'm Chris Conti reporting. Once again, King COVID and the Kids Who Cared is available for anyone to download for free. You can find it in four languages at NicoleRim.com. It's a double whammy. This giving tree is a growing source of kindness and safety in one community. We'll show you how it's helping people. Welcome back. We like to end the rundown with the stories that remind us of the good going on. Today, people in Ohio are paying it forward and helping people stay safe with this tree. Free face masks hang off of it for anyone to take. It's been dubbed the giving tree. The founders of the project say the goal is to make their community safer as a whole. When there's a time of crisis, we um, have this opportunity to be our best selves. This kind of a project shows us what our best selves look like. People are allowed to grab two masks at a time. The Giving Tree Project plans on giving out masks on more trees soon. Well, that's all the time we have today for Coronavirus, The Rundown. We'll see you next time. I'm Usher Qureshi. Thanks for joining us.